Hello and welcome to Nikon Report, your weekly roundup of all the latest Nikon news and all other photographic announcements that we found interesting. It's Constantine here and here is... Becky. We are back. Yes. In person. <laughs> Again. Well, again, exactly. <laughs> and while we are truly Zoom specialists by now, we do prefer a human communication. That's right. It's much easier also to film live and edit and all the rest of it rather than doing it over a remote connection. So here we go. Absolutely. Well, let's start with the news. So the first one up is a reminder that from 1st of April, the prices are going up, not just from Nikon, but also Sony is increasing their prices on a bunch of models. Canon is raising their price on RF and EF lenses, and also Leica, Tekino, Kenko, Zeiss all mentioned that they're increasing their prices. Now, Nikon is pretty much increasing their price on everything but Z9 and the future lenses, obviously, because they haven't been announced yet. But looking at that, it seems it becomes a yearly occurrence. It does seem to be that way. I don't know if that's partly because just generally over the last few years, we've seen a regular increase in materials and demand and, and all that kind of stuff. But it does appear to be a regular occurrence. I'd like to add that it's not just the Z9, but also the 100 to 400, 24, 120. Any of those new releases are protected by the price rise. So don't worry if you've been on one of those waiting lists and you haven't heard anything yet, you won't be paying more for your beloved Nikon goods. Okay, so rough indication if it came out this year, yeah, before the 1st of April, the price will stay the same. Yeah, if it came out, well, anything that was announced pretty much from October onwards, I think, yeah. is is safe. So anything of the recent releases will be safe as far as we know. Okay, well, let's have a look why it's 1st of April. So obviously, because it's a joke. No, it isn't. It's beginning of the financial year in a lot of countries. So that's why a lot of companies do that. The second one up, we're going to take off now. Um, so the, the second thing is, obviously, if you start to look at the inflation, that is happening all over the world. The um, US, as far as I know, is about 8%, which is one of the highest in the long um, term. UK, 6.9%, again, the highest in 20 years or so. So we see that the £100 last year is not the same as the £100 this year. So therefore, the approach price have increased. And at the same time, we're not seeing any improvements in semiconductor shortage. So it's still happening. We also see logistic problems in terms of deliveries. Brexit doesn't help to this either. But also because of this, we started to notice that we're not seeing as many promotions as we used to see. No, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that uh, most manufacturers can't keep up with demand. So they don't want to promote items when they don't have stock to supply to dealers. That's again, not just Nikon, that's all camera manufacturers. But I think that we have to start looking at cameras for what they ultimately are. They're either going to be professional tools of the trade or they're going to be sort of semi-luxury items at mm -hmm. this point. So one would normally expect to have a short mm -hmm. waiting time for any luxury item. If you order a nice luxury car, for example, you usually can't buy that straight off the showroom floor. That's true. I can tell you more. I have a car that I bought three years ago. It was a used car mm -hmm. from 2016. I bought three years ago. So I can sell it now for the same price I paid three years ago wow. because the prices have shut up and because you can't buy brand new cars anymore. So all the secondhand sales have increased in price as well. Yeah. So it's uh, probably a sign of things to come. Just be prepared that if you are after something new and shiny, that you might have to look at it a little bit differently to how we looked at things a few years ago, back in the day when you could just wander into a camera shop and buy absolutely anything you wanted. <laughs> That's true. I can see a lot of positive comments under this section of our video. <laughs> it's going to be great. The reality has changed, unfortunately. And in terms of this, I think it probably will continue this year and potentially next year as well. But fingers crossed, hopefully you will see the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know what more to add to that. Right? Absolutely. So let's go to more positive news. I also have a list of discontinued Nikon products in the UK. Now, don't get too excited. It's not something that we haven't heard before. So a lot of those lenses that have been announced are pretty much the products that we knew have been discontinued. And we also saw some streamlining of Nikon kit offerings, the cameras with the lenses sales as well. So let's just go through the lenses first. So what do we have there? Well, the first one that was a little bit of a surprise actually is the SB300, mm. which is that little flash gun, kind of a supplementary flash gun designed for smaller cameras and those cameras that don't have a built-in flash. Mm -hmm. So that one's been discontinued. We've also got all of the D lenses, so the lenses with the distance information chip and the aperture ring on them. If you've seen 
any of our earlier videos, you'll know the difference between the D lenses and the non D lenses or the newer style. That's but true. Here we have 60 mil, 20 mil, 105, 135 F2D lenses, 300 F4D. I mean, think about this 300 F4E face Fresnel lens has been out for what, two and a half years or so. It's been out since 2018, I think. Here it's we go. So four. even even longer than this. And apparently the 300 F4D was still available for order. But realistically speaking, these D lenses were out of stock for pretty much for the last six to 12 months, isn't it? At least that. For example, the DC lenses, as you were mentioning, we haven't seen new DC lenses for quite some time. Again, those are discontinued. Now, one that did surprise me was actually the 17 to 35 f 2.8, mm -hmm. which again, it's a, it's a D lens. So that one has been around for a long time. They actually discontinued it once a few years back. Several times, actually. Yeah, it's come in and out of production. That one is now officially discontinued. So your offerings in the wide angle side of things for F mount are the 16 to 35 F4. That's true. And then the 1424 2.8. We don't have that happy medium between the two anymore. That's true. But just remember, I mean, we've been with Grace for over 10 years now. So, you know, and uh, I remember talking about 1735 being discontinued pretty much every single year I worked here. Yeah, every, every so often. That's true. Um, we also have, surprisingly, the macro lenses, so the 105 macro F mount and the 60 mil G. Mm -hmm. uh, those two lenses, again, that was a bit of a surprise. With those being discontinued, I wondered if it was just because they're sort of streamlining their offerings in the F mount side Do of things. Do you think the production clashes with the Z macro lenses? Possibly. I don't quite know. I mean, the 105 was for a long time and the 60 actually they were both made in japan and then they did move production to china i know that china factories have had a lot of hardship over the last couple of years between covid and also floods and various other things so maybe they've just decided that they can't continue to produce lenses that there's too low a demand for that's true and then speaking of the lenses that are in low demands i actually a lot of dx lenses are in this list so you've got 12 24 17 to 55 18 to 200 then you've got 7300 DX lens, 18 to 55, 16 to 80. So a lot of DX lenses are there. And that just shows that people who are buying the lenses, they prefer to future-proof their systems by going full frame. Exactly. Now, one other thing that I thought was quite surprising was the TC17 E Mark II. So that's the 1.7 teleconverter. Again, this is F mount. So that one sits between the 1.4 and the 2 times. The 1.7 for us as salespeople, it was always kind of the happy medium between the 1.4 and the two times it was like you don't want to lose as much quality or as much light with the two times but 1.4 is not quite long enough so go for the 1.7 a sweet spot isn't it yeah so that one's been discontinued along with the unsurprisingly the ftz mount adapter mark one because the mark two was announced back when the z9 came out and that has now pretty much replaced out the ftz mount adapter entirely Okay, yeah, and then let's go to the bodies. So we've got F bodies, we've got D750 and the kits, D610 and the kits. I thought the D610 was already discontinued. Well, that's the thing. It's, it's officially discontinued now, but it has been out of stock for so long that we forgot to even check if it's in stock or not. <laughs> and a part of this, we, we also have D500 kit with 16 to 80 has been officially discontinued. Now, D500 body on its own is still available for order from Nick in the UK. However, it's been out of stock for quite some time. I think the last time it's been in stock, I think we talked about it in January. Mm. It was still available and then it's been out of stock since then. And then interesting one, we also have the dual kit of D3500 and three level ones. Now, regular D3500 18 to 55 lens are still available. We're still getting them. Absolutely. But not the dual lens with 7300 lens. And then we also see a lot of streamlining of their Z camera and lens offerings. Remember, we talked about it three weeks ago, mm -hmm. where let's say back in the day, you couldn't order Z7 with FTZ adapter, Z7 with 24 to 17 FTZ, Z7 with FTZ adapter, memory card, you name it, bunch of other stuff. Yeah, so essentially what we had was for every Z body, you would have sometimes five, six, seven variants, kit variants, all of which came with the FTZ adapter or without. What Nikon have done is they've removed the FTZ adapter boxed up kit from the equation, partly because the FTZ is discontinued, but also to streamline the amount of kits that a dealer has to advertise and order. Instead, they've done a really simple mechanic. So if you're buying a Z body of any description, Z6, Z7, Z62, Z72, etc., Z9, you can just 
apply a discount code and get the equivalent discount by buying a separate FTZ2 adapter. So I know from a stock take, stock keeping kind of yeah. point of view, that makes our lives much easier. But I also think uh, as a customer, and you can tell us as Nikon users and purchasers yourself what you think, but I think that makes things much easier because then you just, essentially you're choosing your body and your lens. Yeah. If you want the FTZ adapter, it's an optional extra. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, going forward, if you were to sell that kit, you but you wanted to keep your FTZ adapter, then you wouldn't have this giant box That's true. that you then have taken parts out of. So I think that it's actually a, a positive thing. Absolutely. I can imagine the logistical nightmare of uh, having so many offerings because each variation of the same offering would have its own code, which means you could have Z7 bodies in stock, but you won't have, let's say, Z7 bodies with FTZ in stock. So that's the thing. And then let's say you could just sell a Z7 body and FTZ separately, but you can't sell it as a kit because you have a separate code for this particular bundle. So just by eliminating this, it just simplifies the offering quite a lot. So it's not discontinuous, actually streamlining the offering because those products are still there. They just need to be purchased separately. Exactly. And just to clarify, it would also cost the dealer more to sell you separate items in kit form. So now we've eliminated that issue, at least when it comes to the FTZ2, which is good. Absolutely. And then finally, we also have Coolpix cameras. So we've got W300, A1000, B600 and W150 cameras and all different uh, variations of them. So all those are now gone. Perhaps you may be able to buy them as a last or brand new stock from some dealers. But I will just add a little note to the end of that. We do have stock of some of the discontinued items. So if you found it on our website and it shows that there's one or two in stock remaining, for example, I know that we have the uh, 20mm f 2.8D mm -hmm. autofocus lens. We've got some of those in stock. We do have some of this stuff still left. So if you are interested in getting a hold of the last of the brand new stock, go and have a little look at our website. That's true. It could be a user. It could be a collector as well. Yeah. Just unopened, leave it, put it on the shelf and admire it. And then as well, if you want to buy Coolpix from us, if it's in stock with Nikon, we can order it for you. It's a special order item, but you can give us a call and we can place an order with Nikon. Yes. All right, let's move on to Z9 coverage. We had a couple of uh, tests came out recently. So GP Review published an article which is called Nikon Z9 Studio Scene Shows Great Speed Comes at Little Cost. So there they test the dynamic range of the camera and compare it with other brands, Canon, Sony's over the world. They also look at the image details at high ISOs and also raw compression on different settings as well. So if you want to compare how it compares to all other cameras, so a lot of people compare that night to Sony A1 because they kind of they're on this bracket and then everyone else is slightly below. So you can go there and obviously have fun at the comment section in DP Review website. <laughs> That's what everyone does. They just go and they comment, don't they? Absolutely. I normally need a show after that too. <laughs> Cleanse yourself. All right, next up, Service Photo is offering a free online event, which is called Nikon Z9, Making Sense of Menus. This is on Thursday, March 31st, so very, very soon, and it's uh, presented by Nikon MPS USA. You can book yourself in on the Eventsbrite page. Excellent. Next, <laughs> next one up, uh, we got Photons to Photons, published the measurements of Nikon ZFC camera sensor. So. On your screen, I'm going to put up a comparison of this sensor with Z50, G500, and G7500 cameras. They all have very similar sensors. I, I, would, I wouldn't say it's the same sensor. It's basically variations of the same sensor. And if you look at the graphs, they look quite identical. Well, if you find that interesting, then have a little look at the chart. Absolutely. And if you find the next news interesting, well, kudos to you, because Becky is going to read the news that we don't understand. Okay, so Nikon releases a new Generation 8 plate FPD lithography system. It's called the FX88S. That should be FX88, it's like Turbo 2000. Now, apparently that supports the production of various high definition panels. So with the advent of foldable smartphones, do you remember that? Yeah, a little bit of a, you know, the Motorola Razr. <laughs> and the Sony, do you remember the Sony like Xperia original flip phone? Fit That's true. Flip phone. Actually, the Matrix, I think, was the one that started the flip phone thing. That's phrase. true. What was your first mobile phone? I had a Motorola 
like brick. I don't know what it you was called. You had a brick. I had a brick. Wow. But you see, I had to travel for school. And so yeah. um, and I... On Wall Street, obviously. <laughs> That's why you had a mobile phone. Right. Yeah, okay. I was the first kid in my class to get a mobile phone, but it was because I, I traveled nearly an hour and a half to school and back. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents were paranoid <laughs> about leaving me to wander off into the wilds of London by myself. So I got this big Motorola and I didn't know how to turn the caps lock off. So all my text messages were sent shouting. Yeah, you were shouting the text. <laughs> the whole time. People would look at your text and be like, whoa, why are you <laughs> shouting back? And then I progressed and graduated slowly to a Nokia 3310. Oh, that's a classic. Mm. That's that's as people, a lot of people think that's basically where the original snake came out on. Mm. It wasn't there, but that's... No. That's that's like if people think about 5D Mark II as the first video DSLR, which it wasn't, it was D90. Yes. But that's how people think about Snake and the 3310. Yeah. I will say a funny little story, though, which you can feel free to cut out. Uh, one night... For our Patreon listeners. Yeah. One night I was playing Snake on my phone before bed. This was like back in the day when teenagers didn't stay up on their phones all night because what were you going to do? There was no social media, right? But I was playing Snake and I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, the snake was still going across the screen. Ah, you know why? Because there's an option there to not have borders. That's right. So then you can do that, but... The battery didn't run down, though. That's this, true. This was like the days of actually batteries lasting on Remember your phone. Remember the days where the phone would last you a week without <laughs> yes. any charge? Yeah, I never had to charge my phone. Yeah. Those ones, they're like definitely, what, once a day? At least, at least you have to charge at least once a day yeah. because, you know, all the scrolling, 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 more scrolling, <laughs> more replies. Yeah. All those voice notes I send to people. Anyway, well, so now that we've diverted from uh, the topic at hand. Because we clearly don't understand what this news tells us. No. But let's come back to it and let's push through, Becky. So what they say is with the advent of foldable smartphones, the demand for larger and higher definition panels has been increasing in small and medium sized panels for smart devices. In large panels for TVs, the demand for higher definition panels are also increasing. So, so basically, the new lithography system incorporates optimized technology from the previous generation. Yeah. So, and it's ideal for high definition, small and medium sized panel production. All right. And then it's got multi lens system. It has high resolution, which obviously increases the quality of the production, high overlay accuracy, high throughput and flexibly supports volume production in diverse panels. So all things about panels, still don't understand what the panel panels are. I assume it's those uh, LCD panels that we are talking about. But obviously, some of you who know anything about lithography, do let us know in the comments below. Uh, don't. I don't want to read those no. comments. <laughs> no, you don't want to have your weekend read and work? No. Okay, now let's talk about things that we do understand. Nikon runs photography awards all over the world, and one of them is Marilyn Stafford Photo Reportage Award, which celebrates women in photography. That's right. It launched on the 8th of March in celebration of International Women's Day, and the Marilyn Stafford Photo Reportage Award, facilitated by Photo Document and supported generously by Nikon UK, is granted annually to professional women photographers towards the completion of a compelling and cohesive documentary photo essay, which addresses important social, environmental, economic, or cultural issues, whether local or global. If you'd like to apply or see the previous winners of this award, you can check out the link in the description below. Excellent. Now for some third party news, we have some Voigtlander news. They have announced that they will be releasing the new Voigtlander Nocton D 35mm f1.2 lens for the Nikon Z mount. And that will be released on April 6th. Are you excited, Becky? I am. I'm very, very glad to see some Voigtlander lenses for the Nikon Z lineup. Absolutely. What it tells me that we have another big manufacturer like Cosina that manufactures lenses for a lot of brands and also for Leica, obviously, you know, joining a Z mount. And that also gives opportunity to other brands to consider that mount, I would say. That's right. The beauty of this lens is that they're a lot smaller than Nikon ones, while they're manual focus only. They will sit really nicely on ZFC and also other cameras, but also they will be releasing 50 f2, 35 f2, and 23 1.2 lenses soon as well, which I'm also very excited about. Speaking of the upcoming lenses, the 35 and 50 mil lens, what Lena calls them APO, so it's, which is apochromatic lenses, mm -hmm. which are considered to be top of the line lenses, so they will be very, very sharp. Hopefully we can get our hands on some and try them out. Fingers crossed. That would be nice. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about other brands. So again, we've seen lots of third-party manufacturers announcing lenses. So now we have 
TT Artisan is expected to announce their 32mm f2.0 lens on Monday today when we're recording this podcast. The news hadn't been out yet, but it's expected for them to release this lens in the wild today. It's the first autofocus that mount lens from TT Artisan. So again, we are looking forward to this. And again, the more brands making lenses for Nikon Z system, the merrier. Yes, I want to try them all. Next up, Venus Optics is rumored to announce a new Lauer full frame S 20 millimeter F4 C Dreamer shift lens for Nikon today. Don't know why it's called the C Dreamer lens, but I like the sound of it. Yeah, so the beauty of that, it is a shift lens, not tilt and shift lens, but it is a shift. So at least you get half of what you want. Let's say a lot of people say, well, when you can be released tilt and shift lens as well, now you're going to can get a shift lens and it's quite wide to a 20 millimeter f4 and it will be the first shift lens for Nikon Z mount. Exactly. Now Nikon themselves just did shift lenses originally. Their original perspective control lenses, if you are familiar with the manual focus line, were 28 and 35 mm -hmm. millimeter shift lenses. They had no tilt on them either. The advantage of that is obviously that you can get a different perspective mm -hmm. when shooting a subject without having to move your camera or tilt it so mm -hmm. you could for example take a picture of a whole building by shifting the lens so it is quite exciting to see that and it is wider than any of the nikon manual focus just shift lenses that's true and probably a fair bit cheaper than the 19 their, mil than the 19 mil that's true. so that's going to be an interesting one to see absolutely and then let's move on to some memory card news the company angel bird released film web update version AVX 2.12 for the CF Express range of memory cards. Now, that will allow the support of Nikon cameras like D850, D5, D6, D500, Z6, and Z7. Now, the only problem is that according to Tom Hogan, to update the firmware on those memory cards, you also have to have Angel Bird card reader. That's a shame. Now, I would like to bring up, you haven't written about this, but I'd like to bring up something that we discovered just this last week, uh, thanks to a little tip from Rishi, in fact. He was saying how the- Who is still alive. Who is still alive, <laughs> despite rumors. He's still out there creating content. He just hasn't put any videos out yet because he's been very, very busy. But he did say that of all of the memory cards that he's tested, including the Angel Bird CF Express, the fastest one of all of them is the Delkin Black, specifically the 512 gig. Yes. That is faster than the 128 and the 256 gig. It seems that different capacity memory cards have different controllers inside them, and that's what affects the speed of the memory card. So like back in the day, you could say, I just buy the whatever capacity I need, but the speed is going to be the same. Mm. So let's say if SanDisk would say they're 300 megabyte cards per second, that's what they will give on all capacities. It's not the case anymore. So when you buy a specific CF Express memory card, do check what your read and write speeds are. Yeah. And also just from his testing, even if the on the box, it says up to a certain amount of write speed. Ultimately, when actually testing it out in the field, the 512 gig seems to be the fastest. So good yeah. to know. Little tip from the inside there. Well, that, that basically swayed our decision to stock Delkin Black cards. So they're available at Grace Westminster. That's right. Now, Pergear also released a full line of CF Express cards. Uh, however, note that the sustained write speeds vary considerably as you were just mentioning. Exactly, literally touching on what we've discussed. Mm, so the 64 gig is only 80 megabytes per second. The 128 gig is 130 meg per second. The 256 gig card, which is usually about a standard these days for most people, is 240 meg per second. And the 512 is the fastest, as you'd expect, at 500 megabytes per second. Now, they also have a one terabyte and a two terabyte. The one terabyte card mm -hmm. is 580 meg per second, and the two terabyte is the fastest at 800 meg per second. My question to you is, when you buy a card for Z9, mm. and you want the fast card possible, that's where you would, let's say, need to look through the specifications and reviews and tests, etc. But if you're looking at CF Express card for cameras like Z6 and Z7 and Mark II version as well, would you care that much? No, I've used even XQD cards, which obviously do have a slower write speeds on them. I've never had an issue with the buffer filling up or anything mm -hmm. like that. Saying that, I'm not shooting continuous constantly. I mm -hmm. don't think those cameras are necessarily designed for, for the kind of 
heavy workload yeah. that the Z9 is. But even for shooting 4K video, we've shot with Lexar cards, no problem. They overheat sometimes, but mm. they they generally sort of go and go. And then my Delkin Black works perfectly in the Z6 with no issues. That's true. One thing that uh, not many reviews mention is how hot the cards get inside the camera. And some of them do get really hot. And I'm not talking Z9, which would require fast reading and writing speeds. Cameras like Z6, they get really, really hot as well, which is very strange to me, but my advice as well, if you don't want a car that gets too hot or overheats, do read reviews as well. Yes. Speaking of the reviews, mm. we have the the review. The review with a capital T. From the oracle of the Nikon world, Mr. or Sir Tom Hogan. He's an honorary sir in our mind, and uh, obviously we... Our mate Tom, as we call him. Exactly. Shall we knight him? <laughs> we should. As British. Give him a great We have the right, right? Knighthood. He wrote a very comprehensive review on the Z9 now that he's spent some time with it. He did actually release a blog a few months back when he used the Z9 out in Africa. But this is a kind of complete summary of all his thoughts about the camera. It's no less than... A few thousand words. That's true. <laughs> well, like dissertation. As we all know, Tom Homan is the man of few words. And if you'd like to read the dissertation, his website is the right website to do so. It is. We, we aren't going to read the whole thing to you, but we will give you a sort of summary of the conclusion. Now, I read the review and I was quite surprised at his opening statements, which mm. felt quite scathing at one mm. point. I thought, wow. No holds barred here, Tom. Calm down. He doesn't take any punches, is no, he? No, he's like re absolutely not pulling any punches. But uh, what he did say is there's been a lot for me to write because the Z9 is a lot of camera. Despite my preface at the start of the review, I think I need to repeat this. The Z9 is the best Z system camera by far and arguably one of the two or three best cameras you can buy, period. Which is saying a lot and should be viewed as a highly positive comment. Given the $5,500 price, which places it lower than the Canon R3 and Sony A1, it's difficult to complain about what you're getting for your money. The Z9 is a top performer and a bit of a bargain. A bit of a bargain, I like that. Mm -hmm. just, to, just to take his comparisons between the Canon R3 and the Sony A1 and the Z9, he says, Compared to the Canon R3, the Z9 has more pixels, no mechanical shutter, 8K video with no overheating and costs less. Compared to the Sony A1, the Z9 has no mechanical shutter, no video limits or overheating issues and costs less. But my advice is the same as always. Don't be a mount switcher. There's much to be said in keeping continuity of lenses, accessories, menus, nomenclature and other UX. That's true. So if you think about it, yes, I mean, the beauty of Nikon Z system as well, F mount system, if you're switching from F mount system, even coming to cameras like Z6 and Z7, they would feel right in your hands because the menus are the same, the button layout is the same, overall experience feel very similar. And then you go to Z9 and it literally feels very similar to D6. And so for pros coming from those bodies, it feels right in your hands, the way you feel it. It also feels right in the way you use it. And Tom Hogan, he's very critical in his reviews. Well, he gives it highly recommended list, which is basically the top award he would give. He also very critical to the system. He has 44 little things that he would like Nikon to change with that night and also have a comprehensive list of firmware updates as well that he would like to go from Nikon. It doesn't mean that he criticizes the camera. It just means that he wants the camera to be better. And for him to get highly recommended reviews, he doesn't really give those marks a lot. So, you know, even if you look at the, his at Nikon uh, lens reviews, uh, this is a very high award. So do check it out. It's a long read, brace yourself. But I would say it's probably the definitive review of that night. Agreed. Speaking of uh, Tom Hogan, he also released his guide to Z9. So I haven't bought it yet. You can order it from his website, but his DH50 guide was about 1200 pages long. So I'm sure that this one is probably something like one and a half thousand pages long. So his guides are very detailed. So for some of us who really want to know the ins and outs of how the camera works and how it creates the images, what happens inside the camera when you press the shutter is button, that would be the guide to read. Very good. For your weekend read and watch segment, for those of you who are asking if Rishi was still alive, he is. His recent video with him on the Nikon Europe channel. He did confess to us that he has been doing a lot of work for Nikon Europe recently. The video is entitled The Technology and Features of Nikon Z Mount Lenses with Nikon School's Rishi Shera. So do go and check that out on their YouTube channel. Drop a comment. Tell him how much you miss him on his own channel. Maybe he'll be able to pop out some videos fairly soon. 
we won Rishi. Yeah. yeah. That's what they used to say about yeah, you, you know. That's right. We also have another video for you from Seth Miranda about his experience about that night before the firmware update. We all expect a firmware update to happen in April. Mm. So that should include the 8K 60 frames per second and other video improvements. But if you want to see his experience, because he's shooting with Z9 pretty much every day now. It's a good video to see what he loves and hates about it, because that's what it's called, right? Exactly. So we had a lovely chat with Seth Miranda a couple of weeks ago on our live streams about the future of photographic industry. So do check this out as well. And the last article I'd recommend is about film. Remember the film photography that we talked about last week? Mm -hmm. The three new films that have been announced. Apparently, there's also another film, which comes from Japan camera Hansa Bellamy Hunt. He announced 400 Fugu film, which is a positive E6 type film. Interesting. And apparently it's a completely new emulsion. Wow. So a lot of people think that it's Orvo, the company Orvo who manufactures it, but it hasn't been out yet. So it's not some rebudged or let's say or old stock film or anything like this. So right. that's an interesting development as well. But this article that I want you to look at is called Is Film Too Expensive? An in-depth look at film prices, price hikes, and the real cost of film. So it's written by Ludwig Hagelstein at Silver Grain Classics magazine. So a couple of facts that he showed us. So in 1984, a roll of Ektachrom cost $15.81, right? It costs today is $17.79. Wow. An increase of 13%. The 13% is based on what in 1984 $15 was yes. equivalent Corrected to. for inflation. Right. Interesting. Oh, there's another fact. There's another fact. So in 1952, a roll of Triax cost $11.60. In 2021, it cost $9.09. .09. Again, corrected for 2021 inflation. So it's actually cheaper by 22%. Wow. It's an interesting counter argument for the people saying that the film becomes too expensive. Well, I do agree that if you shoot in large format, so something like 8 by 10 or maybe 5 by 4 it becomes very expensive, it's barely affordable to shoot medium format nowadays, but again, quite expensive, especially if you're shooting like six by seven because you only got 10 shots per roll. But 35 millimeter film is okay. As long as you don't mind to wait for cut of gold for six months, you should be there. You should be fine. It should be okay. Film is another one of those things that I think has become a bit of a luxury item as well. Because if you think about it, in the 80s, film was the tool of trade for professional photographers yes. you couldn't shoot digital yes. now it's more of a hobbyist like i like to shoot film obviously there are certain brands that are pushing their photographers to shoot with film because they want that authentic look but i've also seen some very well-known brands use film filters with you know black and white shots that say kodak portrait on them and things like that that's when... <laughs> true that's true I, i've seen a levi's ad campaign that's used triax film borders on color images yeah. <laughs> so you know but i think the perception of film being expensive comes from the point that everyone has a mobile phone which has a camera in it yeah so you can take a million images at a cost of mobile phone yeah so and therefore digital photography becomes very affordable so let's keep that in mind let's look at d3500 with a lens you can get under 500 pounds or get a nice secondhand d700 with a lens for about 600 pounds etc so i think perception comes from this back in the day film was expensive but there was no other option so if yeah. your family want to record your memories you didn't have digital camera yeah now it's all affordable now film photography can be cheap as long as you don't buy a Leica equipment, as long as you don't buy an F6. Yeah. You know, if you look at something like F100, F80, you name it, there's a lot of Nikon cameras that can be had very inexpensively mm. with a lens that can be had very inexpensively. Again, you don't look at medium format, just look at 35 millimeters, you know. You can shoot film reasonably inexpensively yes. and you're not going for technical perf perfection with film most of the time, you know. So professional photographers who shoot film nowadays, they probably would shoot on medium format and then they'll add this into the budget for commercial shoots. Yes, exactly. You know, but for 35 millimeters, let's say you travel photographer, etc., it is still possible to have it reasonably cheap. But yes, of course, the price on equipment has risen quite a lot since then. Even secondhand L35 AFs <laughs> have increased in price dramatically. Yeah, but if you're lucky, you can score one for £50 on eBay, which we did. <laughs> so, you know, it is possible. So if you don't look for, let's say, highly desired items like FM3, if you look at something like F80 or F501, which is still great cameras, yes, you know, you can get them within, let's say, £100 mark. Absolutely. And also, I think it's a point of patience because sometimes you'll get these surges one week of things that are incredibly pricey and then 
a few weeks, maybe a month or two later, they drop because demand is lowered. So it's a matter of being patient and also, I think, sticking to your budget. If you have a particular price in mind that you want to spend yeah. on a film camera, there's no need to exceed that. That's the thing. And if you shoot digitally and don't want to come back to film, that's also okay. You don't need to put the angry comments under this video below. <laughs> we only get one or two. <laughs> we still love you. Yeah, if you don't love film, that's okay. We'll we'll love you anyway. Exactly. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us this week. Yes, thank you very much for watching and or listening. Please give us a like and a subscribe on YouTube. We are going for 20K subscribers this year. We would love to hit that with your help. So tell your friends, family, tell your mums, cousins, dogs, aunties, uncles uh, to subscribe to our channel. Also, if you're listening on a podcast platform, you can give it a follow, a review, a rating, all that stuff. You really name helps. it. One question I had for our listeners and viewers as well, the Spotify now supports video podcasts. Would you like us to upload the video on that platform or should we just leave the audio thing? I, I'm not sure if people do watch, you know, Spotify podcasts. I see what you mean. Yeah, that would be interesting, actually. Let us know. And also, if you want to find us on all the social medias all the world, you can find Becky on... Rebecca underscore Denezi on Instagram. And it's Konstantin Koshkin as well. We'll see you on Friday. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.